It's over. <laughs> My dear colleagues, uh, we said that we would give them five minutes more, but the five minutes are over. And so I suggest that uh, we start, uh, and we will be perhaps uh, as uh, expeditious in our messages uh, uh, and our uh, exposition, but I count very much on the audience to be as vivid, alive, and uh, aggressive, if I may, as possible in the question, because, uh, because again, we have uh, uh, perhaps even more stuff to discuss than was the case before, and uh, I don't want to uh, take myself too much of the time. I will only say that uh, we, have, uh, we had a dramatic inflection point starting uh, mid last year, and uh, with the uh, inflation being back with a vengeance in the advanced economy and by way of consequence in the entire world. And that, of course, has progressively, with some lags to be frank, uh, changed the monetary policy of the central banks, uh, of the advanced economy and by way of consequence of many others. And uh, uh, even if it was uh, relatively recent, because after all, the first interest rate increase in the US was, if I'm not misled, in March this year, but this was really marking the inflection point. So we are in a totally different universe uh, if I compare that universe with uh, what uh, we had experienced uh, during, say, uh, around 10 years since uh, Lehman Brothers and uh, the post Lehman Brothers start of the recovery. So we are in a different universe, and that has a number of consequences which are considerable for uh, uh, financial, uh, the sharp financial world and, uh, and all the issues that I suggest that we could discuss. As some of you have seen, I thought it was useful to send uh, some kind of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, wrap-up of what's going on at the global level in terms of non-bank uh, finance and uh, the uh, uh, very active way, I have to say, the Financial Stability Board, the IMF, the international institutions have to, and, and the government and, uh, and institutions concerned, uh, to have a, a very active way to try to regain control of this uh, intermediation, taking into account that the, the commercial banks and investment bank in, intermediation has been considerably improved since uh, uh, Lehman Brothers over the last 12 years, say, but uh, it's not the case at all for uh, non-banks and all that kind of uh, uh, intermediation which is coming from the non-banks is probably the place where we have the most uh, dramatic, uh, uh, I would say, threats to financial stability uh, in the world. To, to make a long story short, let me tell you that I consider that we are still in a world which is extraordinarily fragile on this front, uh, the financial front, and that uh, uh, new, I would say, uh, crisis, substantial crisis, uh, are not to be excluded at all. So only for me to list a number of questions. It's not exhaustive. There are many, many other questions, but only to, to be sure that uh, I convey myself uh, some of the questions which seems to me interesting and stimulating, but I, I count on uh, all of us uh, to be, as uh, I would say, uh, imaginative and creative in uh, their own question. I would say first, what is the likelihood of central banks of the advanced economy uh, succeeding in regaining control of, uh, of inflation, they are committed to produce around 2% inflation on both sides of the Atlantic and in the other advanced economy, and by way of consequence in, in many other uh, economies, uh, in the medium term, which I would interpret in saying in three years' time, normally, uh, if the central banks are uh, credible and if they are taking the right decisions, if there are n not new dramatic events that could come, it seems to me 
uh, reasonable to say that, after all, it's pretty possible that we would be in the US, in, Euro in the Euro area, in Europe as a whole, around 2% in three years' time. But uh, nevertheless, <laughs> there is a question mark, and many of us might be disagree, of course, with this, uh, uh, I would say, statement of the central bank, which has been done, again, very, very uh, forcefully by Jay Powell, by Christine Lagarde, and others. Second, uh, as always, do we have any comment on the present projections of the global growth by the international institutions? Some of us are, have certainly comments that would be interesting. Uh, third, uh, are we correcting, cor correctly assessing the divergences between the advanced economies, the developing world, the emerging countries? What about the, uh, I would say, fragility of the developing countries? What about the probability of having big, big issues there? Uh, what is the likelihood of a financial crisis triggered by genuine mo major market corrections? I already mentioned that. Sudden stops in major market functioning, sudden stops in some of the uh, non-bank intermediation, public or private, abrupt debt losses of credit worthiness, asset bubbles, uh, correction, and so forth. Another issue uh, could, should be addressed, uh, crypto assets. What are the, I would say, uh, cause and consequences of uh, what happened in the crypto world? Uh, can we expect much more drama in this domain? And what is the judgment that we can make? Only uh, to convey to you what I think uh, I have to say that I don't understand with uh, the benefit of hindsight how we, we could let such uh, instruments, at least those instruments that are purely speculative, prosper as they have. Another issue linked to, the, to this one is uh, cyber, cyber insecurity. Is it a major threat to financial stability? And uh, which kind of uh, correction can we imagine? And uh, say that uh, uh, can we exclude a major financial disruption which would be caused by climate change? What uh, consequence to be drawn from that? And associated with that, do you share or not, or do we share or not, the uh, judgment that it is very likely that uh, the green transition would trigger uh, the uh, real interest rates at a global level much higher than in the past, taking into account that it's very likely that the savings glut will progressively evaporate, taking into account the immense new uh, amount of, uh, of uh, uh, investment that is associated with the green transition and also the uh, replacement of the stock of capital, which is, make, which is made obsolete because of the green transition. So uh, these are issues that are important. And of course, uh, I conclude by that, because if on top of the change of the monetary policy of the, of the major central banks, we also have real interest rates higher uh, than it was the case in the last 10 or 12 years, it, is aggravating, probably, seen from the uh, financial uh, uh, stability standpoint, the situation. So this is uh, only to, to be sure that, on my part, uh, I uh, have conveyed uh, a number of questions, which, of course, would be very interesting to have response to uh, if uh, it is possible. And I'm speaking, of course, of the, of the speakers, but also uh, of uh, the uh, Audience, because because I know that a number of uh, of you in the audience have also remarks to be, to be made that are important for uh, for all of us. So let me now uh, introduce uh, the speakers. Uh, the, no, I will not introduce all the speakers. I will introduce speakers one by one, if I if I may. So uh, Serge Equé is the president of the West African Development Bank. He's been in the private sector also, and uh, uh, you have both, I would say, the vision of the private sector, the vision of the public sector, and of course, the standpoint of a very important development bank. You have the floor. Um, 
Thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I won't be too long. I would just like to highlight four major, four major uh, key policy objectives we face in Africa in general, I would say, and more specifically in our, into our region, the sub-Saharan Africa. The first one, um, it's addressing the food insecurity. I think it's a major threat we have to deal with um, in a context where our, um, we are in a region, um, in a region where the, the, the median age of our population is 20 years. And we all know that our population doubles every 25 years. So that's a, that's a real threat in the context you know you have uh, uh, um, previously described. The second key policy objective is related to the way we should manage the shift in monetary policy. Um, the new area in which we are, and I have to say that when we last met uh, uh, last year, I was among those who was believing that the inflation would be temporary, a temporary stage. And I have to say that today, when we look at things in details, it appears that we're moving into a new area. I would even say back into the 70s, where I don't know uh, if you, re I'm sure you do, uh, I'm sure you, you do where, you remember where Mexico was, was funding, was uh, uh, getting access to uh, capital market in the, in, the, in the late 90s at 18%, 10 years maturity. And that was, that was not coming to anyone as a surprise. But today, um, getting funding at 18%, is a real, real, real uh, uh, a challenge. So the shift into monetary policy with this idea uh, and this reality of um, the majority, not to say the whole, uh, our, our, our country's sovereign would no longer have access to capital markets. That's going to be a real, a real threat. That's going to be a real issue. The third one is the way we would consolidate public finances amid tighter financial conditions. Definitely. And the last, surely not the least, is the way we would be setting up the stage of sustainable and greener growth. We have last year at BYD uh, launched a sustainable bond um, uh, uh, with 750 million euro, uh, 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 six times oversubscribed. And uh, back then, my credo was cash being king, cash being king we would have to do whatever to get as much funding as uh, we could. So my very last point is, uh, I think to tackle these issues, we need to see how to strengthen the chair one capital of our institution. Answering to this very question, the one and only question that matters, that is, who bears with the first losses? who bears with the, 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 the first piece of losses. So, Mr. President, this is in a nutshell what I wanted to say and I could elaborate uh, down the road. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much indeed, uh, Serge. It is, uh, it is very, very clear, very concise, and uh, of course we understand very dramatic. You mentioned 18%? Yeah, back in the days, yeah. Mexico, that, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, of course, I have the memory <laughs> of, uh, of Paul Volcker regaining control of inflation, inflation in the U.S. at 14 percent or something. And then, of course, a dramatic recession and a dramatic uh, uh, financial crisis in the emerging world, uh, Latin America first and then practically all the emerging world. You're absolutely right. I take it that we are not in the same situation because the central banks are not nonchalant, if I may. They are not letting things go. They have decided with some lags, as I said, but to retake, regain control of the situation. But thank you very much uh, for, for this uh, uh, very, very impressive and quite dramatic uh, uh, picture. Now I turn to Jeffrey Frieden. We know Jeff, uh, even if he was not last year here, if I understand. I was that. teaching. He was Sometimes teaching. Sometimes we have to teach. He, he teach uh, very, very brilliantly uh, at uh, uh, his professor of government, and uh, his chair, uh, if I'm not misled, of the Harvard uh, uh, Department of Government. 
and uh, uh, he, of course, uh, uh, is uh, one of the most important and well-known well professor in uh, our domain, so he has the floor. Uh, we will uh, be very, very keen on having uh, your own judgment. Well, thank you, Jean-Claude. I mean, I, I take the opportunity to uh, take into account your questions and the expectation that we could answer them well in five minutes. I'm going to avoid that by invoking my own comparative advantage, which is political economy, that is the intersection of politics and economics, and I want to focus on a couple of issues that I think are central. They are, um, I absolutely agree with the previous speaker about the importance of what's happening in West Africa and the developing world more generally, but again, given my comparative advantage, I'm going to focus on some of the problems that face us in the developed countries in the OECD and especially the U.S. The end of cheap money has very, very broad and deep implications, um, as Jean-Claude has, has indicated, and the most direct is that it creates a whole series of sources, new or in most cases renewed sources of financial instability as markets re-equilibrate. We saw <clears throat> bubbles in market after market over the course of the last 15 or 20 years uh, with, with very, very low or even negative real interest rates. Um, that era is coming to an end. That will lead to, I think, a whole series of possibilities of, of financial difficulties as rebalancing takes place. It's not surprising, as Jean-Claude has indicated, I think, that, that many of these problems will surface in the non-bank sector, in the non-bank financial institutions. There is, in the, in the regulatory literature, a concept of a regulatory dialectic, which is that the markets innovate, regulators try to running behind the markets, try to figure out how to uh, strike a balance between innovative activity on the one hand and safety on the other. But of course, the regulators are usually running after the, the markets rather than the other way around. The regulators catch up eventually, usually in times of crisis, when, these, uh, the, when the riskier the financial institutions have collapsed. They Im impose a whole series of new regulations, and then in the next round, the private sector tries to find their way around them, and that's what's happening in this instance as well. And, I, and so I think that we face the unfortunate prospect of a new round of zombie financial institutions and zombie firms that will exercise, or at least have the threat of exercising a serious drag on economic growth. So that's the first problem, I think. We, what are the, not, not just where is the financial instability gonna come from, but, and not just what will the policy response be, but um, because there are such powerful uh, uh, pressures, political pressures, to keep essentially insolvent financial institutions and non-financial institutions alive to try to avoid uh, a further crisis, will we have another, I would say, Japanese style or other styles, a series of zombie banks and institutions with, with the resultant drag on economic growth? Second problem is more general, and that is the constraints on economic policy in the current period. Um, monetary policy has been practically, the, or was practically the sole tool of economic policy for much of um, the most recent period, especially after the great financial crisis. Then the pandemic hit, and virtually every developed country and many developing countries spent, I think, dramatic amounts of money, and I think justifiably so, to keep their economies going in the face of a global pandemic. What that means is, that fiscal policy in most countries is now heavily constrained by a very large public debt burden coming out of the global financial crisis and the pandemic. In an ideal world, we would have a monetary policy that was uh, accompanied by a fiscal policy to try to, in this case, because we, we understand that the monetary policy is necessary in the current circumstances is going to be restrictive, we would have a fiscal policy that would try to cushion the blow, for especially for some of the more vulnerable segments of the population. And, but as is, it, on the, in the first instance, in, the, in previous uh, periods, monetary policy had carried too much of the burden. Now we would hope that there could be some sharing of the burden of economic policy shift with fiscal policy, but most countries find their fiscal policy opportunities or, or um, their fiscal policy possibilities tightly constrained by the existing burden of, of public debt. So I think we, we face a very difficult time in the making of economic policy where monetary policy has no choice but, I think, 
seems to have no choice but to focus on fighting inflation and fiscal policy or the fiscal policy that could dampen or soften some of the blows of that mon restrictive monetary policy is tightly constrained. Final point, and this is a, a, a bit of, if you will, political speculation, is to think about some of the political implications about, of what's going on. We are in only the, the very beginning of a period of restrictive monetary policy after three decades at least of the great moderation in which interest rates were extremely low um, and growth was, was reasonable. Um, in that context, as restrictive monetary policies kick in, they will slow growth as they already have in, in, in some countries more than, more than the US, but in other countries, eventually that will that will kick in. That, after all, is the purpose of restrictive monetary policy. Um, I think that from a political standpoint, we can anticipate substantial pressure arising to take the brakes off monetary policy. Um, that is the, now, we could argue about whether these, the, whether this is justified and there are current debates going on in the U.S. as to whether, uh, whether it's worth the candle to raise interest rates uh, at a time when, um, when, or when, what the, what the appropriate balance is concern, uh, between concern over inflation and concern, concern over employment, we find ourselves in a sort of a sweet spot now where employment is doing very, very well, but that won't continue forever. And when there is a clear trade-off between fighting inflation on the one hand and uh, creating jobs or avoiding unemployment on the other, I think there will be political, con there'll be political consequences. I, so to be very specific, I think that this will almost certainly in countries that face increasing recessions in the context of tight monetary policy, that this will provoke a resurgence of populist pressure uh, from segments of the population that believe that central banks and, and the bankers that they uh, are in league with, at least in the view of some, um, are, are doing the, what they can to impoverish the working population and that they should be t taken under control by the political uh, system so that I think that the prospects, the medium-term prospects, political prospects, also presage a great deal of controversy over the appropriate measures to be taken. So those are my thoughts about the intersection of the economic events that we're experiencing and some of the political and policy dilemmas that we'll face moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Jeff. Uh, I only note en passant that uh, inflation is also triggering populist reaction that are very violent. And, uh, and I, I interpret the dialogue between the, the president of the US and uh, the, president, the chair of the central bank as the president of the US telling more or less, you are responsible for inflation. I count on you to do the job. <laughs> I see that you are nodding. We will di discuss that, of course. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, Akinari Ori, uh, well known by uh, a lot of us, of course, has been uh, vice governor of Bank of Japan and is now the uh, special advisor and member of the board of directors of the Canon Institute for global studies. You have the floor, my dear friend. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, it was three years ago I spoke at the World Policy Conference uh, in Marrakesh. So uh, let me begin by uh, reminding you of what I said three years ago, okay? Number one, globalization of economy and finance was slowing down as wages uh, were rapidly rising in China and U.S.-China tension being intensified. Number two, if the U.S. presidential election 2020 brought about a liberal president, uh, actually it did, uh, he would uh, <clears throat> formulate uh, socialistic policies, he did, which would make uh, American psyche more inflation prone. Number three, negative interest rates in longer term bond markets were a bubble. And uh, when it burst, it would entail financial disruptions. That I, that I, that's what I said three years ago. Now, I hope I have reminded you of my prescience three years ago. Today, I would like to uh, make a few points to follow this up. Uh, first, globalization which has slowed down, but it has not reversed the course. China's exports to the U.S. stopped uh, growing, that's true, but th at the same time, uh, 
exports of Korea, India, and ASEAN countries are increasing. In other words, uh, globalization in the periphery of China appears to be expanding. At the same time, U.S. exports to China has continued to increase, and so has U.S. direct investment in China. This is, this is one point. And uh, between 2020 and 2022, there were several sources of supply chain disruptions. Uh, you're familiar with this, pandemic-related lockdowns and uh, Ukraine war-related energy and food crisis. These disruptions are still with us, of course, and far from behind us, but the degree of disruptions is easing, in my view. Unless globalization is reversed, inflation pressures from the supply side of the world economy will recede as supply uh, chains are re restored and alternative, uh, alternative uh, sources are developed. This is number one uh, uh, issue related to globalization and the supply side of the economy. Second, U.S. fiscal policy. Now that the U.S. has a split Congress, no big fiscal spending program or tax reform is likely to materialize within the next two years. So, no big fiscal surprise is good news for monetary policy, which is now aimed at, uh, you know, uh, combating inflation. Monetary policy tightening has begun to have effects on U.S. housing investment, uh, which will dampen rent and other shelter costs in a year. Personal consumption and business investment seem solid so far in the U.S., but they will slow down going forward. Whether all this ends with a soft landing or not, I am perhaps more optimistic than most of the uh, people around the table. Why? Uh, number one, large built-ups uh, in savings in the U.S. Oh, well, that's the case in Japan, too. Huge 10% of um, uh, worth GDP savings accumulated in the housing sector, uh, so is in the U.S. Number two, Chinese economy will get out of lockdown mode uh, sooner or later. You know, herd immunity will present itself once again. Herd, you know, sooner or later. Uh, even uh, you know, Spanish flu sort of thing. It took only three years until the world attained uh, herd immunity. And why not China now? So, China's economy would uh, recover sooner or later. At the time, U.S. Econ economy would uh, economic growth will slow down. Okay. Number three. I see no large buildup of financial dislocations in the U.S. like the one which led up to the global financial crisis. Of course, there are sources of uh, uh, problems, uh, but uh, those sources, let's see, uh, more manageable in my view. Uh, three years ago, actually, I discussed a possible financial problem arising from the asset management industry. A near crisis actually happened in the UK uh, when long-term interest rates shot up a few months ago. That's true. We may perhaps uh, witness a similar episode if my optimistic scenario of US economic soft landing fails to materialize. That's true. But otherwise, I hope the central banks and other regulatory and supervisory authorities will be able to manage the situation by addressing a problem causing institutions case by case. Uh, you know, it's a model through approach. We are familiar with this, uh, Jean-Claude, for a long time, uh, at the time of uh, your head of uh, Paris crowd a long time ago, but uh, about uh, 20, 30 years ago, uh, Green Alan Greenspan referred to it rather than a model, th model through. He called it a sophisticated case by case approach. <laughs> I remember very well. I think it's, it will be, continue to be possible unless uh, systemic disruption happens in the banking sister, system of, major, of a major country, or US or, or Europe. Uh, it's comforting to know that the most uh, of the banks in major countries are well, so well capitalized that they are unlikely 
unlikely to feed into a systemic crisis of the financial system. Let me stop here. Thank you very much indeed. I understand you, you told us uh, very lucidly three years ago what would happen, and you were quite pessimistic, obviously, and now you're reasonably optimistic and confident. So we take note of that, uh, and we will see, of course, we will judge in three years' time <laughs> whether you're right. Thank you very much indeed uh, for this uh, exposition. I turn to uh, Kyung Wook Woo, former ambassador uh, at the OECD and uh, presently uh, president of the Korean Bretton Woods Club and chairman of the board of the Korea Center for International Finance. You have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chairman. I'd like to make two comments on the one about the general uh, uh, monetary policy of the advanced countries where they can achieve 2% inflation target. And second is more about the Korean experience of dealing with uh, this crisis this time. The first one about the uh, global uh, monetary policy, I think there is a, a real danger that we'll end up with overstretch, no, over tightening rather than under tightening. There are a couple of reasons for that. Number one is that it looks like that all the advanced countries' central bank is doing their own tightening, but there is no coordination among themselves so that each country, when they do the tightening, that they also kill the overseas demand of other countries. So that all together, putting all together, they might come up with over tightening. The second point is a little bit uh, related with the professor. Uh, Ferdinand mentioned about this coordination between monetary and fiscal policy. Normally, it would be ideal to tame down the inflation, the monetary and fiscal policy should tighten together. But in this time, you know, because of the very sh rapid increase of the interest rate, there are vulnerable groups in the society that face the danger, and that probably requires more support from the fiscal side. Plus, we talk about this you know, Inflation Reduction Act of the USA, and the same is being mentioned in the Europe, Japan, even in Korea, because you know all this chip industry or EV industry, that requires a, a fiscal support. Another thing is this climate change adaptation cost. We all know that after COP27, you know, we are behind the curve to meet this target. So that there will be huge demand for the fiscal support. So on one side, when the monetary is doing the tightening, the fiscal side, even at the best of the intentions of the government, there are many areas that still require the fiscal spending. So if the tightening should be done by monetary side alone, then you can end up with over-tightening rather than uh, under-tightening. And the third point about the behavioral side, we all know the Fed is behind the curve at the beginning. They were said, you know, this is a transitory. So about six months behind the curve. And the behaviorally, then you tend to overcompensate. And we have all this famous delay of the monetary policy that actually have effect. And one final point that's related to the Korean side as well is the through the foreign exchange channel that also uh, requires over tightening. So when you look at all those things concerned, we might be able to achieve the inflation target, but we we'll most likely have a recession uh, than originally planned by the most recent OEC, uh, IMF estimation. About the Korean experience, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that we have a roller coaster during this year about the foreign exchange market. From April to October, about six or seven months this, our foreign exchange, the Korean won depreciated 18% against the dollar. And we have done almost everything recommended during the Asian financial crisis, during the global financial crisis. We have built up huge uh, foreign exchange reserve over $430 billion. We have net foreign assets also around $400 billion. And our uh, uh, short-term debt against our reserve is around 
We have some capital management, macroprudential measures. So all those things are in place. But when your exchange rate depreciates 18% for just uh, in short period, like six or seven months, still you cannot absorb all those shocks. And the market is very much worried. The, suddenly the business has to deal with huge uncertainty, high interest rate, high dollar, super dollar, and then high inflation. And there's no way to know that where it's going to end. And finally, because of the, all this uh, change and expectation in the market, in November, starting from November, uh, dollar actually depreciated. In other words, Korean won appreciated around 7 or 8 percent. That actually calmed down the market. But during the time until November, if you look at the figure and how much a burden it placed on the monetary policy side. In the first half of this uh, year, we have this energy price hike, food price hike, and then we have this depreciation. So that in our purchase price inflation, about 80% comes from overseas. And it's very much difficult for the monetary side to set up its policy based on its domestic situation. We have a liquidity squeeze coming in the market. We have many companies facing difficulties. But because of this inflation pressure coming from not only uh, commodity price increase, but also exa no, exaggerated by this uh, exchange rate, on October monetary policy, we had a forward guidance that we're going to perhaps come up with a small step, like 25 basis points. But we ended up with 50 basis points. And that's exactly the point that through this free exchange channel, some of the monetary uh, authorities will end up with uh, more tightening than desired or warranted by the local situation. And another point uh, in that regard is that our central bank government famously mentioned that you know, our central bank is independent of the government, but not independent of the Federal Reserve. And no more times we can you know, follow with the Federal Reserve with all this capital flow. But as I said, for six months, 18 percent, nobody can handle it. And there is a big pressure from the business and the political side to come up with a, a swap arrangement with the Fed. And it's true that we had a swap arrangement in, uh, during the Asian financial crisis. And no, during the global financial crisis, there are nine countries with a non-convertible currency that was given this lifeline to show up the confidence, not so much for the money, but so much, it's more for the confidence. And also during the pandemic times from 2020 to 2021, unilaterally, this was given by the Federal Reserve. But now probably it's not a good time, even though we ask for the uh, Fed swap, I don't think they're going to uh, accept it. But when you have seen such a big roller coaster movement on the foreign exchange market, I still think that there must be some more structured way for non comfortable currency countries to have reasonable expectation of having access to the Fed, which is still missing. You know, the last one is given by unilaterally during the pandemic times. So that may be something that international financial architecture is missing up to now. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Only to be sure that uh, I understood fully that what you have said. Uh, there was a period of, if I understand well, depreciation of the US dollar by 18%. And appreciation of the US dollar? OK. And then you said roller coaster. So then, at a certain moment, you had the reverse. Of 8%. Of 8%. Just in one month's time. Yeah. And so first, depreciation, which we understand pretty well, because uh, you did not augment interest rates, and the US Fed augmented massively interest rate. Exactly. With a, a lag. But OK, so that's not terribly surprising, obviously, uh, if, I, if I understand well the constellation of interest rates uh, between the US and Korea. And, and then in a recent period, there has been some kind of catching up. Okay. So you wanted, you wanted the swap 
to correct the fact that there was an interest rate differential which was substantial? Is that, is that the message? No, actually, uh, in terms of the you know, RER, as you just mentioned, when the Fed tightened very rapidly, and Korean interest rate also began to follow up. But despite that, because the tightening was so rapid, so within just six months or seven months' time, Korean won to appreciate 18%, even at the best of you know, Korean authorities' persuasion to the market that fundamental is okay, RDI is okay. This is not the Korean won problem, but rather caused by the Fed's uh, tightening speed. But that does not calm down the market, because if you are in the business, and then you suddenly see your interest rate is going up, inflation is going up, and then we are the country very much dependent on import of energy and import of the food. I, I, got, I, got, the, I yeah. got the point. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's, that's clear enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. I turn to Pierre Jacquet. Pierre Jacquet is president of the Global Development Network. Are you still in New Delhi, uh, Pierre? Uh, no, I'm now working from Paris, but still with GDN. But, but you're still uh, yes. in, in the Global Development Net Network. Yes. And you are professor also yeah. at the Ponce et Chaussée. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's quite difficult now because I tend to agree with all the analysis of risks that uh, have been made so far around the table. And if I want provocative, to be provocative, maybe the question to ask is whether we are focusing on the right risks. Um, and before turning to that, let me start with uh, inflation. Um, and, and, and I'm not critical of what the central banks have been doing. I think they have acted quite wisely and they have shown a restraint that is quite, uh, quite actually uh, uh, laudable. Um, the, the, the difficulty is that we have not really seen real inflation so far. We don't have any wage price spiral, we, at least in Europe. We have a very strong increase in the prices of food and energy, so there is a risk of inflationary spiral, but it's a risk. And given the action of central banks, uh, I think we could be quite confident that uh, the uh, monetary policy will, 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 will manage that risk. However, monetary policy is not the ideal instrument for that. We have a supply shock, and we are reacting to the supply shock by restricting demand which can be quite costly for the economy. Um, so we need to keep in mind the fact that we are in a bind there. If we want to avoid inflation, we are using an instrument that is not exactly the instrument that we should uh, have in our toolbox to address the supply shock issue. Um, the, this is compounded by the fact that I've not heard any convincing argument about the cost of inflation. There are costs, we all know that, but uh, it's, it's hard to find a, a very convincing, convincing analysis of this cost of inflation. I would say that for me, the cost of inflation are, are, are actually focused on the, on, on the poor segment of the population, which is certainly a big concern. But beyond that, are these costs high enough to uh, forget about all other risks that are there? And the reason I mentioned that is that, for me, the major risks today are not financial, they are political. They are in the fabric of society. They are in the demand from various groups of society, not only the populist, to understand what the economy is about. And an increasing number of people think that the economy is about enriching the rich. I put it bluntly just to be provocative. So, and, and, and for me, it has become quite urgent to address that concern. So again, I'm not at all uh, trying to, to say we should accept inflation, we should have, no, I, I, I like very much what has been done. What I'm thinking is that when we project to the future, when we, when we share our concerns, for me, the concern is not inflation, because it is under control right now. It, it, may, it may become a risk, yes, so we can, we can list that, but we, we, we talk too much about it. 
the main concern for me is not there. It is in the fabric of society. And uh, I, I'd like to just put that on the table for, for discussion. And I'm, I'm, I'm probably more provocative than I'm, I really feel, but just for the debate. The second point and, and last point I want to make is about crisis. Uh, I would agree that we are facing a very um, extreme moment of convergence of several crises that are unique. Um, but I'd like to point out that capitalism is about crisis. And they play, and there are two dimensions of crisis, one good, one bad. Huh? The good one is that uh, they help us uh, find the actual value of things over time. So you have crisis, you, are, you, you, are, you have bubbles in the stock market, and when the bubble explodes, it reveals the true value. So that's fine because there is no other way to reveal the value except that having overinvestment in a stock and then discovering that this will not be the, uh, the activity of the future and therefore the price collapses. So these are the good crises. Of course, the speculative dimensions of uh, the crisis is the bad side of it. And this is not new. So what is new is that each of the crises that we see have specific short-term causes that will differ from the previous crisis. But what strikes me is the uh, continuity of the profound reasons of the crisis, which are very simple. These are periods of overinvestment followed by periods of over disillusion. And it was written already more than a century ago, and, 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 and I remember several, I mean, of course, we had Kindleberger and, and Minsky, but even Clement, Clement Jugla in the 19th century wrote uh, extraordinary pa uh, passages on, 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 on this uh, characteristic of human behavior. As long as we are not able to deal with that, we will have crisis. And the so the, and, and I like very much what Jeff what was saying earlier about about regulation and this uh, loop between regulation and innovation. We regulate that creates an incentive to innovate to go around the regulation, and then regulation becomes obsolete, and we have a crisis. So we need to re-regulate, and and, and 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 it goes on. So it 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 means that maybe when we think about regulation we should try to think about a continuous attention to regulation, a sort of adaptative regulation that tries to analyze risk in, a, in, in, in an ongoing real-time basis. And we don't have that because each time we are successful in regulating, we say, hurrah, we regulated. And we forget the fact that this is a short-term response based on the last uh, crisis and not going to be adapted to the, to, 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 to the coming concerns. So it seems to me that what this situation is creating right now is uh, 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 restoring the issue, the debate between markets and governments. And as a believer in the market, I strongly believe that we need governments to help the market work properly. And right now we have a problem of regulation uh, and we have a problem of valuation. And part of the uh, social risk I was mentioning is due to a poor valuation of labor. And I think that the crisis, the, the pandemic, revealed that a number of low-paid jobs have a social value that is way above the wages. And that is something that starts being mentioned in the debate, not only by populists. And it's a source of concern that, for me, is, should, should rank higher than inflation, because inflation, we have the instruments. And as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, we, we, we have also the Financial Stability Board that is an excellent job. We have banks that are highly capitalized. So in, in a way, we, we have been able to manage, not too badly, that side of it. There may still be risks, but let's not forget the more, the deeper risks that are there and they are in the social realm. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. You were uh, uh, very provocative, I have to say, and uh, that will trigger certainly a number of questions. I reserve the right to comment on what you have said, but not now. Thank you very much indeed, Pierre. André Lévy-Long, former president of the Paribas Bank and the... Uh, legendary mathematician, founder of, uh, and president of the Louis Bachelier Institute. Not everybody knows that Louis Bachelier was a visionary a ma French mathematician, uh, inventing great, uh, 50 years before. In 1900, 1900, he was the grandfather of financial mathematics uh, applied to the markets uh, when his thesis in 1900. Uh, he was totally unknown until he was rediscovered by Black and Scholes and a few others. Uh, 
<laughs> discovering the formula. Well, the uh, Bachelier, Louis Bachelier Institute is a non-profit private uh, research network which was founded 15 year, 16 years ago by a group of French uh, in companies, uh, mostly financial companies, uh, French fin academic institutions with the support of the French Treasury. Uh, working uh, basically initially in applied mathematics to finance, and then we spread, we broaden our <laughs> scope to cover other subjects, including climate, for the last few years. And, and my topic would I like to be the uh, interaction between finance and geopolitics, what I call the weaponizing of finance. Uh, it's not a new issue. Uh, remember that uh, sanctions and boycotts were used for political means uh, against uh, countries like Angola, Iran, Sudan. But what is new is that uh, since last February, uh, it involves Russia, which is a, a significant economy, and that is a major change. So if you look at finance as a weapon, the, the question is, uh, what is the impact of this situation on the huge amounts of investments, which, as uh, Jean-Claude mentioned, will be needed to manage to finance climate change. Because we're talking about very large numbers. So the fact that finance is used as a weapon has imp implications in terms of systemic risk, in terms of the behavior of financial institutions, in terms of the markets. And it is not clear to us, and we're working on that, how can f finance in general su support and uh, make it feasible to uh, accomplish these huge investments without uh, creating systemic risk, without breaking the system, without uh, creating major unmanageable situations. So that is a key issue for on which we are trying to start a project today with the IFRI, by the way, on this specific subject, again, which is uh, very easy to express, to formulate, not easy at all to, to, to develop and to make as a research project. I think I will, I am well under the five minutes you asked for Jean-Claude. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, then we will go back to you to have your judgment on the risks and the materialization of all the risks that we have. Thank you very much, André. John, you have the floor. Everybody knows you, and uh, uh, we are suspended to your lips. <laughs> Jean-Claude, you're too kind. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there are so many things that we could talk about. I'm going to try to limit myself to just uh, two. Uh, one, I'll, uh, uh, my good friend uh, Akinarian Hori has described uh, an outlook that I think is quite uh, congenial and quite plausible. And what he has said is that there are reasons to think that the outlook may be somewhat more benign than the consensus. If I understood you correctly, it's not saying that worse outcomes are not impossible, they are possible, but that the consensus is a little bit too pessimistic for the reasons that you uh, laid out. And I, I find myself in, uh, in broad agreement. But I thought I would step back and uh, remember there's been so much focus on monetary policy recently for good reason. But I think it's worth going back and noting that this comes after a long period in which monetary policy has demonstrated that it is less powerful in controlling the economy than had been thought. And uh, that, or to put it another way, that in the wake of the global financial crisis, that we've had a series of unexpected developments in, um, in the, especially in the advanced economies that were not anticipated and we still don't understand completely but has uh, been much more powerful in um, uh, shaping the financial and economic environment than, than policy has been. 
the, we've had a period of slow growth, of low investment, of a uh, uh, lower than anticipated uh, labor force participation, and at the same time, unexpectedly strong corporate profits. A combination's been associated with sustained, unexpectedly low real interest rates. That has produced the unexpected result that despite the very rapid growth of public debt in the context of the global financial crisis, that for advanced economies, that debt service as a percentage of public sector revenues in the advanced economies actually fell, did not rise. So a kind of amazingly benign uh, period that also was associated because of this combination of lack of pressure on public finances despite the rapid rise in debt and the uh, unexpectedly strong corporate profitability produced very strong performance of asset prices, especially equity prices. So to me, this lays out, uh, and, and what we saw, of course, the, that despite the um, uh, generalized uh, agreement on a inflation targeting format for central banks and agreement on universal agreement, essentially on 2% as a target, uh, no central bank seemed to be capable of hitting that target and virtually all persistently uh, had inflation below, below target. Then have uh, come the, the shocks uh, that were also unanticipated, the effect of COVID and the war that resulted in this rapid increase or this dramatic increase in inflation that caught central banks by surprise and demonstrated that since their models failed to anticipate, that suggested underneath that, as I said, these factors that appeared important in the wake of the global financial crisis have been incompletely understood. And therefore, their incorporation into models produced models that didn't produce the uh, accurate uh, forecasts. So it leads us with some important questions. Uh, clearly, it, what we saw in inflation was a combination of strong support for demand through fiscal means and otherwise in a context of constricted supply. What, uh, and I think what Aknori Hori told us is what we're going to see now is recovery of supply and a, wake, a waning of the effects of stimulus that is going to correct the imbalance that produced the inflation. And what we don't know is how quickly it's going to come back, how quickly inflation will come back. Uh, what we have seen is that the run-up in long-term interest rates has been less than had been anticipated. Either this would be interpreted as that investors expect in recession is coming, they anticipate, uh, and therefore that it's going to be uh, an unhappy road to uh, low inflation. And I would say this is still uh, uncertain. And if we need to look at uh, some aspects that will be critical in determining the this outlook, one, uh, is of course the obvious performance of wages. So far, wages have lagged behind inflation. Either you can take that as an end, the, con the consensus view tends to say, this is going to, there's going to be catch up and that wages are going to accelerate and that we are going to end up with a wage price spiral that will be uh, uh, truncated only by conventional means of uh, monetary policy 
action that will produce a downturn. But that's just a surmise based on the notion that what happened before will happen again. What we don't know is what has happened to expectations after a decade of unexpectedly low inflation. And, uh, but uh, obviously, the formation of, wage exp of uh, inflation expectations, including in the labor market, is going to be critical. It will be critical to see if corporate profits can be, will prove to be resilient, which means that asset prices also should be more resilient than is anticipated. And the, uh, the course of long-term interest rates, real long-term interest rates, is going to be very critical for the outlook for fiscal policy in the near term. Because if long-term rates stay high or go higher, there's going to be tremendous pressure on, on the uh, fiscal accounts in the advanced economies because we're going to start to see a rise in debt service costs as a percentage of revenues. So big unknowns, I end up also a little bit more optimistic than the consensus, but that may just reflect my own personality rather than analysis. These are, but there are critical things to look at and it strikes me that the, what I think are most important seem not to be at the forefront of discussion. Let me just add uh, two uh, other uh, remarks. And that is uh, what we can see coming, almost certainly, and it's, this is something that is not a, a new insight, is that developing country debt is going to be a problem. We can see it coming. We, can, we know the outlines of the problem. Uh, in the, let me say, the outlines of the problem of the solution, which is that the big change in the composition of the creditors of the developing economies that has rendered the Paris Club ineffective in dealing with the problem and requires new cooperation Recognizing that the Paris Club was no longer the appropriate venue, the G20 created the common framework. I'm repeating what I said uh, yesterday. Uh, the common framework so far has been notable by its sluggish progress, not to be more critical than that. Uh, this is an issue that I posited yesterday is a litmus test for the outlook for cooperation at, the, uh, at a global level. And the, in essence, to a certain degree, the relevance of the G20. The framework, the G20's replacement of the Paris Club, the common framework for debt treatment, must be made to work. There needs to be a compromise that makes it work. Otherwise, it uh, will be not the uh, biggest issue for the global economy, but for those worried about global inequality, there needs to be a solution. Thanks. I've talked too long. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed, uh, uh, John. You you are optimistic. Or you are confident, but with a lot of nuances, if I understand well. I turn now to uh, Jean Claude Meyer, uh, Vice Chairman International of Rothschild, uh, previous uh, gérant de Lazare. He, very well known, of course, by all of us. No? Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, at the last uh, WPC, my view on the financial markets was optimistic. My forecast was for a transitory uh, inflation, like Serge Equet, and like everybody, as a matter of fact, and for a plateau on the stock markets. Of course, I was completely wrong on the transitory inflation, like everybody, like every central bankers, by the way. Excuse me, Jean, sorry, Jean-Claude, for your colleagues. Uh, but I was right on the stock market because the Dow Jones last November was at 36,000, and last November it was at 34,000. So the things went relatively well in this forecast. Of course, after COVID, nobody could anticipate uh, 
a war in Ukraine leading to increased inflation and a stagflation in which we are now embarked. Today we face a very dark situation which is tackled by central banks with great difficulty but leading hopefully to better days. Very dark situation, you all know everything about it. Uh, GNP increase is low, uh, next year will be 1% in the US maybe, 0.5% in the Eurozone. Inflation is very high, 8% in the US, due mainly to labor market and supply bottlenecks, and with a core inflation of 6.3%. In the Eurozone of 10.6%, because of energy and food, with a core inflation only of 4.3%, due to consumer demand, huge liquidities after COVID provided by central banks and supply bottlenecks. The war in Ukraine has accelerated further this inflation. China is a problem with a very low growth. It's, it's amusing that China does create a problem to worldwide capitalism. As a matter of fact, it's very ironic for Mr. Mao. Uh, uh, the US labor market is running very hot with 3.7% uh, only. Interest rates will increase next year, which will reduce growth and create volatility. And this crisis is global. For certain banks, the fine tuning is extremely difficult. As we know, stock markets depend on inflation, interest rates, economic growth, profits of companies. And today, inflation is high, recession fears are mounting, and therefore, financial markets are very volatile. And central bankers live in a tragic dilemma because their measures have adverse collateral effects, such as medicines for doctors. And therefore, fine tuning is difficult for them. Their key question is how much can they increase interest rates to reduce inflation and at the same time avoid a recession? They are faced with this tragic paradox. Every good news on growth and jobs are in fact bad news because they maintain inflation. And on the contrary, bad news on growth and unemployment are excellent because they anticipate reduction of inflation low interest rates, and then possibly a market boom. Today, central bankers seem to shift towards a slower tightening to avoid a recession, especially as it takes a year to measure the results of the rise of interest rates. Stock markets are therefore a little better oriented since a month. Other central bankers believe that if there is a chance of tightening monetary policy too much, the risks of doing so are not as serious as letting inflation prosper. Hawkish central bankers would do whatever it takes to curb inflation against dovish bankers in favor of a pivot, as we all know. This December 14th, Fed will increase once more their, its interest rates after four increases already this year of 0.75%. Will it be a 0.75% increase or just a 0.50% increase? Same question for ECB the day after. A 0.50% increase by Fed is not unlikely, and it is my hope, my bet, especially because annual consumer price growth in the US has slowed a little bit lower than uh, the 8% forecast down to 7.7%, which should ease pressure on the Fed. This moderate increase would give an optimistic signal to the markets. But because of the bigger inflation pressure in the Eurozone and of a delay taken by ECB vis-a-vis -vis the Fed, ECB the day after could raise its rates to 0.75% in spite of the fact that in the Eurozone, inflation is mainly due to a short supply and that a rise of interest rate will not solve this situation. A 0.75% increase by the Fed or the ECB will affect the economic growth 
and the stock markets. Next year will be volatile, difficult, unpleasant, a tough year, to quote uh, just the chairman of Mubadala a few minutes ago, uh, because growth will decline with a recession in some countries uh, until the summer. Stock markets will remain unsteady, bumpy. Interest rates should increase at a slower pace in parallel with a lower but sticky inflation going down and energy prices, shipping rates, and raw materials falling thanks to a lower growth. This growth contraction should also raise the unemployment up to 5.5% in the US maybe, which will have a positive effect against inflation. But we can have a more rosy scenario in 2024. Once the job is done, to quote Jay Powell, anticipations for 2024 should improve with a certain growth, including in China, lower inflation and lower interest rates. In brief, a soft landing, which is a dream, maybe. Provided there is no more COVID, that the war in Ukraine does not deteriorate, but there is no war in Taiwan, of course. In this framework, we can be a little more optimistic for the end of next year with a recovery in 2024. I will join Mr. Akinori Hori's optimistic views now. Uh, naturally, the US stock markets will then behave better than the European stocks. Thanks to the strength of the dollar and the lack of problems which Europe has to face, the European zone uh, being more fragile than the US and more affected by the Ukrainian war and by inflation due to the price of energy, of food, and the high demand stimulated by European budgetary policies. To conclude, we feel badly in the short term, better in the medium term, and contrary to the projections of Keynes, not dead in the long term, maybe a dream. Thank you very, very much indeed, Jean-Claude. Uh, I reserve the right to comment a little bit, and then we engage in the fierce uh, conversation. Uh, Jean-Claude, my notes of the last year are, uh, of course, uh, dated the uh, uh, beginning of October. So beginning of October, you were absolutely right. Jay Powell was saying inflation in the US is transitory, and I have reasonable expectation that in the course of next year, namely 22, we will be around 2%. He said that in October. And uh, you were right when you said all central banks, more or less, were saying the same. By the way, I have to say the modeling, and John was very clear on that, the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model are plain wrong when you are in a very rapid period of transition. We experienced that with the real economy in after Lehman uh, bankruptcy, and we are experiencing that because Jay Powell could not say that without having some papers by uh, the thousands of PhDs that, were, that are in the staff of the, of the Federal Reserve. So, so there we have an immense problem, uh, which explains largely the lags. There are other technical re uh, reasons for the lag uh, to have been considerable because in November he said it's not transitory and the first increase of rates is only in March. So a big, big uh, delay between the lucidity, recovered lucidity and, and what, what they did. In my opinion, it's also due to the fact that they had, uh, I would say, some kind of link between the the uh, non-conventional quantitative part of monetary policy and the conventional interest rates. They said we, we will increase interest rates only after we have stopped the net purchases of tradable securities. It was said on both sides of the Atlantic and it was one of the reasons why there was an additional delay of five months, six months, depending on, on the central bank. That was, in my opinion, in retrospect, a big mistake to link the two. As far as I am concerned, I was not preaching the fact that there was no problem. I 
wrote myself, don't follow the I, prophets. I was not accusing you, the, 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 no, yeah, yeah, but, but you could, the I was prophets. just quoting your, your colleagues. Yeah, but, but I've, I've colleagues. always been against the theory according to which interest rates were eternally very low and that you had to borrow massively in order to be uh, uh, in the best uh, situation possible. Uh, a lot, unfortunately, it was a little bit uh, close to a conventional wisdom at a certain moment. It, it, it was obviously wrong. Uh, other um, remark, I'm not sure that we have the same figures as regards core inflation. I look only at core inflation, and I look at core inflation as is published by Eurostat for, for uh, Europe and by the uh, statistical office in the US. We have the same level of uh, core inflation, which is around 6.3, 6.5%. I have the figures for the euro area, 6.6% in November. 6.6 .6 is not four. 6.6 .6 means that even if you put aside oil and gas and the agro-products, you still have a level of inflation which is impressive. And uh, the job of the central banks is to get down from 6.6 to 2% in three years' time, as I think they, they can. But uh, the fact that we have the same level of uh, underlying inflation, say, uh, core inflation, on both sides of the Atlantic, and not the same level of headline, underlines what has been said by many of us, namely that there are differences between the US and Europe, because in, the US, in, in Europe it's very, very much more of a supply problem, and in the US it's much more of a demand problem. And uh, uh, I give you the headline, headline 10% in Europe, 7.7, .7, last figures I have in mind for the US. So, 2.3 full percent difference, which means that the real economy in Europe is attacked by, uh, by uh, uh, the situation, by inflation, and by the war in Ukraine, much more, of course, than in the US. So that explains why the monetary policy in Europe is much more benign than the monetary policy in the US. But both seems to me exactly appropriate if we want the core inflation to get down, because again, even in Europe, it is not only oil, gas, and uh, agro products. Uh, they are, and uh, I'm not sure that I am in full agreement with the idea that there is no spiraling of uh, prices. Uh, to, to get 6.6%, you must have some spiraling of prices, not massively yet wages and salaries, but in the US, you have 6% wages and salaries. So practically the level of core inflation that I was mentioning. So I think we, we have to be very careful, including in Europe, because we, we have more, more or less the same problem. But I agree that uh, it is good that there is a difference of interest rates, uh, which is significant, very significant, to be frank, between the US and Europe. And of course, it has also the inconvenience that was, yeah, that was uh, underlined by our co Korean friend, namely uh, the euro is weak and it, we import inflation in Europe, that's clear, and, and that's, that's a problem. But I will not call for accelerating the increase of rates in Europe, but I'm, I'm reasonably satisfied when the both, I would say, interest rates are going up uh, calmly, quietly, but, uh, but uh, firmly, because, because it's very important that we are all convinced, all, uh, I would say, economic agents are, are convinced that 2% is credible in the medium term, which is not absolutely obvious uh, today, <laughs> frankly speaking. Uh, two, two other remarks. One, on, on the fact that uh, we, will, we are likely to have inflationary pressures in the time to come, it's uh, probably a secular, of a secular nature and not of a, of a, I would say, cyclical nature. We have the green transition. It was mentioned. I think it's very important. We have deglobalization, which has been mentioned with nuances, but I think it's 
part of the fact that uh, in comparison with the previous period, we have to expect more pressures, say, upward for, uh, for the prices. And we have the blue collar uh, issue or the uneasiness of the uh, middle class or the lower middle class and so forth. It seems to me that it is already there and uh, to the extent that in some respect the US is a little bit the leader, I interpret the sequence Trump-Biden as, uh, I would say, accompanying the emergence of the blue-collar, uh, furious, <laughs> I would say, uh, uh, <coughs> infuriation uh, transmitted in the political arena. Because clearly, to imagine that uh, the Republican candidate for the presidential election could not be the, the, the I would say, the, the, the guy defending big business, but the guy defending blue collar is really something which uh, is absolutely incredible. And, and the Biden, of course, uh, is on the same line for, for very good reasons, of course. So I, I mentioned that, and I take it that uh, in all European countries, as you said, uh, uh, clearly it is also, Pierre, it, it, it's also the case. I mean, we, we have to expect, but it will play the role of a pressure an inflationary pressure also, because unit labor costs are inflation, <laughs> arithmetically. So uh, a, a last point uh, I wanted to, to, to mention also, uh, uh, we, we are in a situation where you mentioned uh, Minsky, animal spirits, uh, <laughs> it's absolutely clear that, uh, that we have uh, uh, we, we had the abnormal situation uh, that you consider part of capitalism. And uh, Keynes uh, said that also eloquently, uh, Minsky uh, very eloquently. So I think it's undeniable. But from time to time, you have situation which looks a little bit out of historical record. And we are very close to situation where accumulation of debt, piling up of debt, uh, accumulation of uh, incredibly accom uh, accommodating policies over 10 years, uh, and um, uh, this very rapid change of uh, monetary policy for good reasons, all that creates a universe which, frankly speaking, seems to me a little bit less rosy <laughs> than was said by most of us, frankly. So I don't want to be l'oiseau de mauvaise augure, but it seems to me that maybe we have serious problems ahead of us. But who wants to take the floor? Uh, so may maybe we, we will turn around in that sense, please. Yeah. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Mr. Chairman. There is a... Um, a school of growing criticism of unconventional monetary policies. And personally, I'm agnostic because I feel like I lack all the tools to really make a determination for or against it. But do you have a view on it? And then are you concerned by the other part of the criticism, criticism which is that there's basically too much debt overall uh, you know, between governments, sovereign states, and uh, and private players. We'll take a number of questions, of course, and then the speakers will respond. Thank you very much indeed. <coughs> Thank you. And, uh, so I, I, I thought this conversation was quite interesting in what it did not say or what was hidden in the conversation. I think I, I will not step in the inflation conversation. I think it's an important one, but I think there are even more important things behind inflation, as has been said by, by many. Uh, I think we are feeling the compounding impact or the compounding effects of traditional crisis, and we react with traditional tools and traditional reactions. With on top of that is geopolitical shift that we are considering, which basically makes these things a little bit more complex than 15 years ago when it was basically the Europe and the US discussing the future of finance. Now it's a little bit more complex, plus a required transition with climate. So that's a lot to swallow. And I don't think we've agreed on what is a policy mix nationally and internationally to address these compounding effects and what is the social contract we want to discuss with people and these are very striking questions that we have ahead of us which are not just for the financial people to address but I think it should be part of their of their thinking. 
Uh, and in, as part of this, to echo what, what Jan uh, just said, I think we are moving also, and it's been said by, by several from a period where leverage was the name of the game, and it was pretty easy. I mean, you could borrow at zero. It was very easy to buy real estate. It was very easy to do M&A. It was very easy to value uh, Tesla at whatever price. And now we are moving to a balance sheet stress where there is nowhere to hide because it's very unlikely that the central banks will step in the way they stepped up in in the past. So this is a complete change of the game. And I don't think we've started to really think what it means going forward. My third question, and it's related to the real economy. Uh, are we going to finally allocate capital properly? Meaning, do we have the risk pricing, and I'm, I'm turning to André, do we have the risk pricing mechanism that will properly allocate capital and properly price the risk and, and stop wasting money where it's not needed? Coming back to my point on, on, on the transition, etc. I think at a moment where there are more investments needed than ever, uh, and when there is uh, capital, it's probably not scarce, but it's risk adverse. So people will rush to buy U.S. Treasury instead of investing in things that are really necessary for the world and necessary to repair the social fabric that, that, that Pierre mentioned, some of the points that John made. So I, I think this question is central to me. Are we heading in the right direction or is it just a blip and we will face inflation and not address the core issue, which is are we allocating our scarce resources where they are needed for the next 20 or 30 years? I don't have the answer. And finally, now of course, because it's me, I, 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 I'm a little nervous with all the discussions on ESG. So the focus on environmental, social, and governance issue. And now that it's becoming really serious, that we realize that it's not just a nice transition where you reallocate one or two percent of your savings per annum, but it's way deeper. Uh, people are becoming nervous. So let's say in the, yeah, the Economist made this cover page this summer, ESG, these three letters will not save the world. Texas is giving green credit to BNP Paribas and BlackRock and say, we don't want to work with you because you're too green. And then California say, we don't want to work to you because, with you because you are not green enough. So uh, is it serious or is it another joke? Uh, another tool of the financial industry to fool the people. I don't know, but there is growing doubt. So, again, not totally uh, linked, but I wanted to share these four uh, messages. Thank you very much indeed. I'm not sure, frankly speaking, that we ever had a nice period where uh, you were tranquil and uh, everybody was tranquil and the central bank were tranquil. I have known permanent crisis, permanent period of crisis. And the worst recent crisis was the so-called very calm and tranquil and great moderation world, which ended with uh, the worst crisis ever since World War II, which could have been the worst since World War I. So, so we, we are permanently in a dangerous world, I, right. I never say. said tranquil, Jean-Claude. I, I agree that... No, no, uh, I never we, said tranquil. I uh, agree I'm that the, the accumulation of threats <laughs> are there and uh, particularly demanding, and on top of that, with the geopolitical element that you mentioned, and we did not mention too much because <laughs> we, we all agree that it is a common factor, I guess. What, what you said on ESG is very important, and I expect that we will uh, all respond to that. Thank you very much. Madame, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur Trichet. Um, I have a question about inflation emerging markets like Turkey and Egypt. Um, there is a trade-off. I mean, you don't need to be an economist that higher, you know, to, to curb inflation, you need to raise interest rate. But poor people, I mean, interest rate, low interest rate is basically a subsidy for everyone, especially the poor, because the poor live on credit. So how can we, in, for example, in, in Turkey or Egypt, how can we, how can we fight inflation? Without, without really creating, because if you want to raise interest rate, that will mainly affect the poor who live on credit. So how can you fight inflation without creating, creating unrest in this country? Thank you. Thank you. Good question <laughs> for uh, all of us. Thank you very much. You have the floor, madam. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jean-Claude. Um, um, I, uh, I will um, echo um, my friend, um, John Lipsky's uh, remark about uh, the common framework and the importance of, of saving it for sovereign debt restructurings that are coming and they're looming, um, you know, by an estimate, um, you know, between 35 and 60 countries will be in emerging markets, um, middle income and uh, low income countries will be in financial distress um, in the next two years. 
Um, so, you know, the, the common framework was introduced uh, in 2020 in November. Only three countries have applied, um, and it seems to be, um, you know, um, a, a logjam um, at the moment uh, with some uh, very, very small steps, um, uh, you know, progress. And one could say the problem seems to be China, but nobody knows the reasons, you know, po possible explanations. Of course, on the China side, that uh, you know, Chinese lenders don't want to crystallize losses, which is understandable. Their balance sheets uh, are already under pressure from the real estate collapse and uh, other uh, difficulties. Um, there is a lack of coordination among the various institutions in China that have done the lending. And um, they're simply inexperienced in sovereign debt uh, workouts, and uh, they're afraid that uh, the Western uh, lenders will take advantage of them. Um, and uh, the, the fifth reason could be that uh, you know, debt issues are part of a broader um, geopolitical situation. Um, you know, China might see no reason to cooperate on debt until they could extract some concessions elsewhere. But in truth, nobody knows. You know, it's it's complicated, as John mentioned. You know, now, uh, China is rising. Uh, well, has risen um, as uh, as the third uh, major lender um, group um, in the sovereign debt workouts, in addition to uh, Paris Club um, members and uh, private creditors. So, um, but um, you know, common framework. Um, progress remains obstructed. Um, is it des destined to fail? Um, I think not. Um, an enormous amount of political capital has been invested by official creditor and now um, other stakeholders in the common framework. Um, they will not easily let it fail. Um, I hope not. But how to break that logjam? So what is needed, I, I believe, is the credible way of assuring each creditor group, including um, non-Paris club um, bilateral creditors such as China, India, and other non-Paris club um, creditors, that once a restructuring agreement is reached with them, no other creditor group can later extract from um, the debtor country more favorable um, to the creditor um, treatment. So the best idea so far uh, that I've been uh, reviewing is uh, getting uh, traction um, among the participants in Washington um, is the proposal to use the most favored um, creditor clause um, to deflate any expectations China or others might have um, by holding you know, out or holding hostage the process um, and uh, that would be able to extract better deals, uh, better deal once uh, the you know, deal with um, others was made. So it will have to be a cross-creditor um, group uh, most favored nation clause um, compared to um, comparability uh, treatment as a Paris Club um, principle, which is a variation of mo most favored creditor clause. And it will have some, you know, it will need to have some courage from, uh, uh, from debtor countries um, to propose it because that will be a unilateral proposal and others hopefully will uh, will join, but it seems to be better than um, that the current logjam. And uh, so I want to also thank um, um, Hori san um, uh, because I, I was, you were sitting next to him on, uh, um, uh, three years ago in, in Marrakesh. Uh, and, I'm sorry uh, to interrupt you. Do you have a, a precise question uh, yes, for no, the speakers? I, I, yes, uh, to John. For John in particular, uh, yes, perhaps. Yes, exactly, uh, because uh, you um, no. Well, I'm actually continuing with John. Maybe I'm answering a question with John uh, that whether it will, um, you know, uh, the, the common framework will fail. I think, you know, it shouldn't fail. It won't fail. We'll, you know, it won't be let fail. But there has to be a solution. So, and, and uh, you know, saying that China, you know, I wonder whether John agrees um, whether China is the problem or it is the multi, you know, multilateral issue. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I, I think you, you have a very, very important point, of course. We, we have a real problem with China, to my knowledge, and mainly with China, even if there are other creditors, uh, potential creditors that are uh, at stake, of course. Thank you very, very much for this important question. Please, 
Thank you. Uh, well, I have a quick question to the panel about the future of the dollar as a reserve currency. Uh, I think last year we had had quite a few discussions on the fa on the role of the dollar as a vehicle for the U.S. to enforce uh, the extraterritoriality of, of their sanctions. And um, what we've just read is that the uh, recent trip of uh, Xi Jinping to uh, the Gulf uh, ended in uh, deals which are going to be labeled in uh, yuans or whatever you call it, or remnibis. Uh And so I'd like to know how the panel views the uh, future of, uh, of the dollar as a reserve currency. A very important question, of course. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, who wants to take the floor? Please, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to build on what you said, Mr. Jacquet, on the question around a supply chain driven inflation. I think when we look at inflation today, it's driven by, um, I think, four major supply chains, energy, agri-foods, metals, and semiconductors. And so the question is, do central banks really have all the tools to tackle this supply chain disruption? Thank you very much. Please. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a rather one, one remark. I'm an, an entrepreneur, and I talk also with quite a few other, other entrepreneurs, and I'm also on the board of some manufacturing companies, middle-sized, but, but quite sizable manufacturing companies. And I think we have another factor. It's, I wouldn't call it supply chain, shock, but it is the lack of skilled staff. And I think this is, a, this is a major problem, and this is exacerbated by the fact that we have to do a lot increasing administrative work through a very high level of regulations and reporting on that. And it does constantly things added. For instance, in Germany, there are now two very heavy things added. This is this control of the supply chains, the ethical and uh, the control of the supply chains where there's a reporting and the sustainability reporting. It doesn't mean that, uh, that I think it should be misused, but, but it is a, a lot of ad additional work coming here. And I think that the uh, wage price spiral is already rolling. Uh, I know in all the companies where I'm involved, uh, there will be considerable uh, uh, rises in payment, uh, six, seven percent in this one. In certain countries, like for instance in Austria, we give not necessarily that we say we have a less percentage rise, but they get a one-time payment to, uh, to balance out, which, which comes to, to the same. And in Germany, there was recent, I think last week, there was a conclusion of the largest trade union, the um, metal and electric union, where they decided on a, on a very high uh, price increase, w wage increase. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I, I note en passant that it is not exactly the same to augment the regular wages and salaries because it's recurrent and to give a premium which is not recurrent and of course would be a good way to avoid this which uh, price uh, sparing. But thank you very, very much indeed. Bruno, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, I would like to have your view on the future of the, de of the debt accumulated to, uh, to face the COVID crisis. I heard John mention the service of the debt is manageable, but the ratio of debt to GDP is still uh, very high. And do you think we can uh, look at that with benign neglect uh, because it's on the balance sheet of the central banks and it's a sort of helicopter money? Or do you think it's a real issue for a financial risk? And in that respect, inflation, uh, the view is sometimes that inflation can be uh, useful to, to reduce the debt. Uh, how do you react to that? <laughs> Thank you very much, Bruno, indeed. I think that we... Uh, no. We, can I pick up the last questions from the audience and then we turn to the speakers, please. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to circle back to developing economies in a way. I mean, uh, twin deficit crises are looming large uh, with very tight fiscal space. Uh, 
especially given that uh, expenditures will be needed for climate change adaptation and mitigations. And at the same time, uh, my question mostly to, to, to Mr. Ecri actually, do you think that um, private banks and state-owned banks uh, in developing countries are capitalized enough to weather the shock? I mean, uh, in the case of uh, credit default from a state, uh, given that state-owned banks are mostly holders of a public bond, there is a, a high risk in a way in developing economies um, that some major systemic banks will fail as well. I'm speaking for countries like Morocco or Tunisia that I know pretty well, uh, and that have very tight buffers and that haven't necessarily followed the governance and uh, capital regulations um, um, recommendations that have been done after the global financial crisis. So do you think that the, the banks are capitalized enough and what can we do to avoid a further crisis on that? Thank you very much. I have a last question there. Yeah, thank you. It's actually more of a uh, throwing into the discussion a little dimension that wasn't mentioned and we are in the Arab world so I would like to throw in the uh, general Arab outlook on growth and inflation. So I'll just be very brief. Uh, the growth rate of the Arab economies is expected to rise in 2022 to record about 5.4% compared to 3.5% in 2021, driven by many factors, most important of which are the relative improvement in global demand levels, the high growth rates of the oil and gas sectors, and the adoption of stimulus packages to support economic recovery by many Arab governments. In line with global development, the general level of prices in Arab countries is expected to rise during 2021. It is expected that during 2022, sorry, the inflation rate in the Arab countries will reach about 7.6%, and it's expected to reach about 7.1% in the year 2023. And I'll conclude with this, although some Arab countries are directly affected by the current challenges as they are major importers of food commodities, most Arab countries can play a major role in reducing the global and Arab food gap and achieve self-sufficiency self in some commodities such as wheat and petroleum products. My question is to the, uh, to the panel here or to the gentleman here. Uh, what kind of uh, uh, structural reforms are needed actually to relieve supply constraints and boost productivity and economic capacity? Uh, in order to alleviate the global food crisis, what kind of policy action is required uh, that can help out in that dimension? Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, dear colleagues, I have a tendency to consider that they ask me, they are has been so many questions. I counted 11, and I'm sure that there were 12. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> each of us uh, can pick up uh, what he would like to uh, comment, uh, it seems to me, as concisely as possible, because then I think that the best to, to terminate our, uh, our uh, exchange of views is to, to make a new tour de table. And uh, I would, uh, if you agree, I would turn first to Serge and uh, then to Jeff and then to Akinari and so forth. But I, I ask you to be very, very concise, but to pick up really the questions that seems to be uh, exactly in line with what you, you, the message you want to give. Please, Serge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, there's, uh, there's one question that I'd like to answer to. It's naturally re related to the question of the capital. If you remember 2008, uh, the lesson learned uh, 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 back in the days were, to my, to my view, we had two lessons learned. The first one was the need of a tighter regulation the need of a capital increase to increase the buffer. And you remember back in the days, uh, uh, the crisis we were in and you were at the command was that the crisis was worldwide and global. And it was kind of the end of the world. You remember that, right? And I think the two lessons were, one, first question of the, the uh, tighter regulation, the capital increase for the financial industry, and more specifically, for the banks. And we've been through, you know, capital increase in all the different banks. The second lesson learned was the question of the SDR. Remember, it came back on the table, right? So 
What I think is there's a there's a kind of uh, uh, um, there's a kind of uh, 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 symmetry here, where we have the same discussions. Where I think the, the the Western banks are well capitalized, even though there's still the question of the capital increase on the table today as we speak. And the second thing, as you're well aware, the question of the SDR uh, um, uh, and the allocation of the SDR. The, uh, the current allocation um, that has been done, that has been made, has been uh, um, uh, um, of no use for the uh, Western countries, of no use at all. And the debate today is how can we reallocate this to those who basically need, fundamentally need, this SDR. So for me, there's a, there's a symmetry here between the crisis we faced back in the days and the, 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 the crisis we are currently uh, uh, facing with the, two, um, uh, with the two lessons learned I've earlier mentioned. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very, very much indeed. As regards the SDR, uh, when we learn that uh, not a single SDR has been reallocated de facto, it's absolutely terrible. Jeff, you have the floor. Yeah. I, there's so many questions I, I will try to focus on. Well, one short one and then, then uh, another that I think um, gets to some of, some of the questions that have been raised, by no means all. First, <clears throat> on the dollar as a reserve currency, um, I think my view is, um, or what I should say is the consensus of experts, which is my view, but uh, in fact, the, the, my view is that the, the dollar is going to be the principal reserve currency for the foreseeable future for one obvious reason, which is that there's no obvious, there's no clear replacement. The, the euro is widely used as a reserve currency, um, but it's probably not going to increase much given it, the, its troubled path. And um, the, the renminbi really is not an international currency in any way, shape, or form, and it's far from having the, the, the Chinese financial markets and <clears throat> Chinese monetary conditions are far from being appropriate for it being adopted by the private sector as a reserve currency. At this point, it's used primarily by uh, central banks that have a connection one way or the other, geopolitically or economically, with, uh, with, with China. So I don't see, you can't beat something with nothing, as we sometimes say, and I don't see an obvious alternative to the dollar out there. The dollar is likely to remain the principal reserve currency for the foreseeable future. That's Foreseeable future means, I don't know, maybe the next 10, 15 years. I want, but the main thing I was going to say is about uh, the core issue that some have addressed and that I started with. We could argue for the next many hours about the underlying causes of the current inflation and the appropriate response, but the reality is the really existing economic policy trend is a strong anti-inflationary policy in the OECD. And so, so we can debate whether that's the right policy, the right, wrong policy. That's the policy that's being adopted. <clears throat> there's very little question that it's going to continue to be adopted, and there's very little doubt about what its impact is going to be. We're going to face a period of relatively high uh, interest rates and a quite a strong dollar. Uh, there may be some fluctuations, and I understand the importance of the volatility. Um, but I think what we should focus on is the impact of the, the truly existing anti-inflationary policy, which is a high interest rate environment, which will bust a lot of bubbles, and a strong dollar. Um, that will lead to, I think, a, a, a series of crises in the emerging markets, those whose debts are denominated in dollars, and for, the, for, for even those that are not denominated in dollars because the local currency debt interest rates are going to be rising substantially. That's going to create debt servicing problems. Despite what John says, I think, you know, the, the, the debt service has been easy now in low interest environment. The environment is changing dramatically, and so I think the problems are going to surface. They are not going to affect the U.S. directly, but the, the constraints on fiscal policy, and you'll get, you can, you can jump in if you want, but the constraints on fiscal policy are real, and I think in an environment in which there are very, very substantial fiscal needs, like for the energy transition, like for softening the blow of some of these inflation, the anti-inflation policies, governments are going to find their hands tied on the fiscal front in a way that will be politically difficult. Um, and third, there will be distributional effects of these anti-inflationary policies. And these distributional effects, we've seen them already. Um, inflation is not across the board, otherwise we wouldn't worry about it. Inflation is about relative price changes. So it's relative price changes and relative wage or income changes um, will affect 
very substantial groups of the population that, and there will be a political backlash. What form it takes, I don't know, whether it will be left-wing populism or right-wing populism or non-populism, but there will be a political backlash. So I think, to me, there are lots of very important issues that people have raised, but there are clear implications of the anti-inflationary policy that the major central banks are gonna be pursuing. They have to do with imposing real pressure on the emerging markets, on uh, raising some real questions about the fiscal constraints on, exist on OECD governments and distributional factors that will lead to a political backlash. And those, I think, are the issues that we will face over the coming years. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed, uh, Jeff. Aki Nayan. Thank you. Let me take up two issues. Uh, the first one is uh, dollar as a reserve currency or the international vehicle currency, i.e. 100%, uh, not 100%, 90% agree with Jeff uh, Friedman because of the remaining 10%, he said the for, foreseeable future, he said 10, 20, 30 years, well, maybe 50 years. Uh, you know, they, say, they say, give them a, give them a date or give them a number, but never both at the same time. Right. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, three years ago, I spoke uh, at a plenary session of the International Monetary System because uh, it was a time that the BIS published the uh, then latest uh, statistics. And three years passed, and the BIS published a uh, tri so-called triannual uh, exchange market uh, review. Uh, the uh, survey was conducted uh, April of this year. The result was published rather recently. I have uh, statistics here. Uh, it's, it's exchange market turnover, and the currency composition, total being 200, because it takes two to tango, yeah. right? So uh, US dollar cap continue to capture 88% uh, out of 200, the same as 2019. A Euro, 31 from 32, the same, 31, 32. Yen, 17, 17. Uh, sterling, 13 and 13. So as far as major currencies are concerned, I always say that, uh, you know, uh, there has been no big changes, actually, over, the, over many decades. Uh, one notable uh, development was uh, Chinese yuan, uh, renminbi, you may call. It was 4% uh, out of 200, 2019, uh, rose to 7%. Uh, in April 2022. Uh, it was a big <laughs> increase, although uh, from a very low point. But at the same time, there was a decline one percentage point of, of the shares of Russian ruble, and also one percentage point decline in Hong Kong dollars. And uh, a few other, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, emerging market uh, currencies, uh, Mexican pesos, a half percentage point declines, something okay. like that. So in other words, uh, renminbi's uh, rise might be accounted for a substitution for uh, ruble for obvious reasons, and also Hong Kong dollar for another obvious reasons. Uh, so this is one, one thing. And, 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 and uh, this, is, this is one uh, fact I wanted to uh, say. Uh, another point I wanted to make is about ESG. You know, from a pure e economics theories point of view, um, using uh, financing for um, greening or whatever purposes will distort Pareto optimum. It will be much better to use um, common tax and border adjustment to uh, pre preserve efficient resources, uh, efficient allocation of resources. But it will be much more difficult politically to employ carbon taxes across the board. And, you know, this is uh, <clears throat> only one example. When political decision or, po you know, right political policies are difficult to employ, hmm. politicians ask financing uh, people to do something. Uh, this is, I'm afraid, would uh, <clears throat> this would create another bubble or distortion. Uh, so populism is influences many aspects of uh, financial world. <laughs>
whether it's good or bad. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. My figures for the dollar, the euro, and the other cu uh, currency is not exactly the same. As regards the reserve assets, we had at the beginning of the euro 70% for the dollar, 20% for the euro, and uh, the number three was the yen, and uh, we had a reserve asset of 5% approximately for the yen. Then the dollar came down over 20 years from 70 to 60%. The euro remained at 20, and the yen was also unchanged. And uh, the 10% that the dollar had lost were in the sterling, in the uh, renminbi, in uh, the Canadian dollar, in the Australian dollar. So there, there has been some kind of redistribution. But it's clear, I have to say that en passant, if there was the political decision to create a European Federation, overnight, everything changes because the death and, and the liquidity of the, of the treasury market uh, of, of the euro would totally be equivalent to the US. So we, we, we are changing the universe. Uh, it's not very likely <laughs> that we will have a political federation soon. So, can uh, Kyung Wook, you have the floor. Uh, I have two comments about the dollar uh, as a reserve currency. I agree with the, uh, both of the two previous speakers, but I just want to mention that the more we begin to see uh, dollar as used as a financial weapon through the SWIFT, yeah. I think there will be more incentive to, to find a way to go around it. I don't know when all those incentives got to reach a significant threat in the foreseeable future, probably not, but I just want to point out there's a strong incentive, the more we use these weapons, that there will be incentive to, to go around it. The second point, uh, which is not so much an answer, but I just want to raise it, is that because the dollar is so strong and reserve currency, and most of the advanced countries have a standing sub-agreement, but whenever the market becomes very much turbulent, for many uh, countries without all this uh, privilege of a convertible currency, it would be much better for the uh, stability of the global financial market that there is a reasonable expectation that when this uh, Fed will come with some selectively, of course, but sub-arrangement, to support the system. We, as I said, we have two cases, but we still don't know when this will be mobilized. And that creates a more uncertainty for most of the non convertible currency countries. So I just want to mention it. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much. I hope one of us will respond to the question on ESG and, uh, and the, uh, uh, I would say, drama that, has, uh, that is associated with this uh, deviation, perhaps, uh, that the finance, uh, global finance is organizing to take advantage uh, of uh, fake ESG. But that's another story. I turn now to uh, Pierre. Um, thank you. Um, let me go back to uh, Bertrand's uh, remark on the allocation of uh, capital and said, uh, when are we going to talk about ways to allocate capital properly? Um, I see three uh, responses to that. One is taxes, and what I have in mind is a carbon tax, obviously, and um, I think that uh, we need to restore the um, dynamics that would lead to the adoption of a significant carbon tax if we want to be uh, um, consistent with... Uh, the, um, uh, the talk uh, about uh, transition, energy transition, and climate transition. And by the way, uh, we have been talking about the green transition around this table, but a little bit marginally, because at the same time we are talking about growth. And growth is growth of GDP, and GDP is not uh, a very helpful indicator of transition, of green transition. So we do have a problem of metrics, and that would be my second, my second approach to it, which is we urgently need metrics to guide the transition. 
because we are in a bizarre world in which in one sentence we mention green transition and the other sentence we call for faster GDP growth. And the two are right now a bit inconsistent. And the third, and that's where I'm still going to be a bit provocative um, uh, with some, uh, some qualification, uh, is in fact budget deficits because what has been done uh, during the COVID period is to uh, direct private savings who, which would have been poorly used and allocated through the government who presumably did a better allocation job. That's debatable, but if the, if the private capital is poorly allocated, then there may be governmental solutions. So that's a way to restore uh, the, uh, uh, the meaning of, of public deficit. Now, I would uh, again uh, mention what uh, Jeff rightly said. We are in a situation in which we have overground budget deficits. So the margin of maneuver is very, very tight, whatever we think about budget deficits. So, but just to mention that we, we should see the allocation of savings as a global, uh, with a global approach rather than always separating public and private because in the end this is a bit artificial, right? Well, what counts is the allocation of capital in the economy and we need, we, we know that the green transition requires a lot of investments. Let me stop there, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Pierre. André. I guess that you might have uh, yes. some message to respond to some of the questions, no? On, on ESG. Yeah. On ESG. We, we, we have a work in progress in trying to measure, to, to quantify, uh, you know, more scientifically, if, if you wish, some of the elements of ESG and to build a database of, you know, controlled numbers which would make it significant. But because of the time being, I fear a backlash on ESG. There's huge amounts of money which is invested on the basis of implied ESG or you know, published ESG with, with usually very, very little substance. So the real point I wanted to make, which is the same question in a different way, the pricing of risk is extremely difficult when you talk about climate because the externalities are huge, both positive and negative externalities. Uh, and they are, you know, and you know, we know all very well that pricing externalities is not very easy. You know, it, it requires regulation, government intervention, and so on. And when you talk about long-term investments, it's even worse. You know, we heard this afternoon, the, the time it takes to, to create new mines, you know, to, to, to change uh, processes in industry, huge amounts of money, long time frame, and huge externalities. Mm. Uh, so, plus the fact that uh, banks have to pay a higher price for risk than non-banks. Mm. So there will be a shift also of the funding outside of the banks. So we are facing a very, very difficult situation in which uh, I don't see how we can avoid uh, government intervention, you know. I, I, carbon tax is one way to simplify part of the problem. Uh, it's unlikely that it will happen on a global basis. <laughs> but uh, uh, in other words, uh, to go back to what Pierre said, uh, we, externalities means in some ways government intervention, which means in some ways deficits. So we're not out of the woods. I would have suggested maybe rules, regulations, uh, global rules, global recommendations. We have created a year ago a new board, which is the International Sustainable Standard Board, ISSB, which is, has very ambitious, has already hubs uh, in Asia, Tokyo and, and uh, Beijing, hubs uh, in Europe with uh, headquarters in Frankfurt, uh, based also in London, based in, uh, in, uh, in Montreal. I mean, they are very ambitious. Uh, every, every country is on board. China is on board. And so I, I, don't, I don't know whether uh, uh, the specialists are expecting something from this uh, new board, but the international community uh, is betting on this new board. 
and uh, they have practically completed their, uh, the members, the membership. Uh, so I don't want to elaborate too much on that. I was a little bit involved in the, in the creation, the setting up of that uh, new board. Uh, anyway, uh, more deficit seems to me absolutely aberrant. So everything has to be financed through savings, savings, savings. In a country which we know very well, Andre and I, who is spending around 10% more than equivalent countries in public spendings, there are certainly uh, you know, savings to, to make and we could perhaps uh, re reallocate massively. But that's another story. Now, John, a lot of questions for you. Okay, uh, just one, one comment on what you just said. Uh, and that, that strikes me, it, for a long time, <clears throat> the, uh, I remember uh, vividly at the April 2009 G20 summit at the ministerial meeting of the G20, the question was raised, should the finance ministers take up the issue of climate finance? And without naming names, there were some strong voices saying, absolutely not. No expertise. This belongs in the, in the UNCCC. This is not for, our, for us. So what you had for a period of time was the formulation of goals that with, with no consideration of the sources of financing. And it strikes me that what, what's happening now finally is these, uh, we're starting to get this, to push this together and get some realism about what can be done. Okay, the, uh, the points uh, that I wanted to make uh, uh, first, for sure, the outlook for inflation and how difficult it will be to restore low inflation is absolutely critical. And my point was, we went through a decade in which we had lower than expected inflation and even today we don't really have an explanation of why that happened. So we can't be sure because what we're doing now is saying, if we look to the past when we tried to get inflation down before it took this, this, and this, and if that happened then, uh, we just can't be, can't be sure, but for sure, if it is difficult to get inflation down, there will be some consequences. And one of the consequences is, uh, as I started out, for the advanced economies, they have gotten away with this big increase in debt because interest rates and debt service have been so low. And if, that, if they're unsuccessful, we're going to have a big problem. Now, I should have been, I should have been more clear. Um, this has not been true for the developing economies or the emerging economies. And in fact, a decade ago, at the, at the end of the, the global financial crisis, debt service burdens or the percentage of public revenues that we required to cover debt, public debt service in the, in the developing economies was about the same as in the advanced economies. And today it's multiples of, of the uh, burden. This is why we know that debt, debt problems are coming for the developing countries, because if anything, it's gonna get worse. In their interest rates are gonna go higher, and they're, for especially the non-resource uh, uh, non rich developing economies, growth is, their income's gonna be uh, lower. So something needs to be done. This one is foreseeable. What has to happen? One, we need better standards of debt transparency. And that's going to require cooperation by everybody to put, uh, put the numbers on the table if we're going to come to some kind of an agreement on, debts, on uh, debt restructuring and debt relief for the developing economies. There has to be a, a, an understanding on all sides of where we, where we start. Second problem is private sector engagement. Right now, the... Uh, the standard operating procedure is the public sector makes the decisions, turns around to the, uh, e even if we overcome this issue of debt transparency, how the, one of the problems of the common framework, which is a problem of the Paris Club, is the public sector gets together and then dictates to the private sector as to what their role is and engage, that, that produces log jams. Uh, so that, we need a better, a better form of public, of private sector engagement and cl better clarity on how do you, what is fair burden sharing. At any rate, the, my point here is 
we know the problem's coming, it's going to be broad and big, and we've, we need to, to do better. And uh, finally, one, one ex slightly extraneous remark on uh, the, the uh, process of not, debt, of, not of crisis resolution, but crisis prevention. And that involved the Fed swaps to the, emerging, to the uh, large emerging economies uh, that uh, uh, Professor Herb was just talking about. Uh, I always considered that um, the Fed's granting of uh, swap lines to uh, a small number of large emerging economies as systemically destructive, or dis at least systemically uh, disruptive. Because the question is, uh, right now, the, the system, if there is a system, is in the wake of the global financial crisis, the major central banks created permanent unlimited swap lines among them. Let's call out, those are the guys fly, flying first class. Now, the Fed created business class, the favored friends of the Fed, that under circumstances that are not, not specified in advance, uh, the Fed is willing to supply swap lines to countries in amounts and durations that are, un, that are not, not known in advance, under criteria that are not known in advance. I couldn't see why that was systemically helpful because the implication is if you're worried about, for example, creating stigma about going to, e.g., the IMF for help, that's a way to make the stigma even worse. If there's going to be crisis prevention in a world of securitized finance, you need insurance-like, swap-like facilities. The IMF should be given swap-like facilities that they could offer to all its members, and I think that would be helpful. Sorry. Thanks. Thank you very much. Jean-Claude? Yes, I would just comment that the emerging countries, which we help to finance from time to time in certain countries, are facing today, indeed, huge difficulties. They cannot even finance their budget deficit right now. Not only that, but they have problems of defense vis-a-vis -vis the Islamist world, and they cannot, they cannot uh, pay the, the, their armies. Uh, which is uh, extremely detrimental today. When they have, for instance, Ivory Coast for 10 years would pay between 8 and 9% interest rates. They cannot afford it, which is a problem. Now, I'm sorry, Jean-Claude, but Christine Lagarde uh, uh, confirms my hardcore figure, which is not 4.3%, but 4.8% for the Eurozone, which is in her speech in Tallinn in November 2nd or 3rd, 4.8%. Uh, Co-inflation which excludes uh, has I, risen 4.8%. As I said, I don't take the ECB figure. I take the statistics figures you're of right. the so Euro area. You're right. <laughs> and, uh, no, but I'm sorry, because, because I do the same for the US. And they are always a way of... Uh, Yes. Uh, introducing uh, uh, alcohol and tobacco, and uh, I don't know why. I mean, you, you have this idea that, and I understand why they do that. Same in the US, because they, they try to avoid the spiraling, the wages yes. and, and prices spiraling. And so the lowest possible, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, core inflation is better from their standpoint, which I fully agree uh, from their standpoint. But I think that what counts is what are the real figures, uh, which are, by the way, very different from country to country also, to complicate the European reading of the situation. As you know, inflation in Fran national inflation in France is much lower than in many other countries because of the cost uh, which is paid by the fiscal uh, uh, in interaction. Uh, the, the French are... Uh, spending a lot of money to alleviate the price of oil and gas and so forth. So, but thank you very much, Jean-Claude. We will, we will check bilaterally yes. and with Christine exactly where we stand. Thank you very much indeed. I think that we, we came through many problems. I note en passant that this issue of whether for the dollar or for the euro, it is wise to have sanctions that are freezing the reserve assets is a real, real issue. And I was public to be against those sanctions against the Central Bank of Russia. And I still consider it's absurd 
we have given the rest of the world the signal that to have dollar or euro as reserve assets is a bad idea. And we called for uh, many countries that are uh, in the rest of the world are not specially sure that at any time they won't have a problem with the US or with the West or whatever. And we told them, look, uh, be careful. You should put no, your money in other instruments. That, that was a big, big, big mistake and a very bad move. My, my sentiment, my sentiment. A, a second point, which I wanted to, to make uh, clear, uh, and again, it's not the dollar, it's uh, the euro also. And the Europeans know how the US can be inward looking we, when we were applying by the rule and by the treaty, the, the accord that we had with Iran. And the US Congress decided to punish us because we were implementing what had been decided and signed. That was absolutely infuriating all the Europeans. I mean, there, there is something there. The, the dollar, in a way, is a public good <laughs> at the global level. And, uh, and uh, the New York market is also a public good. So to, to decide that it is the private property of one particular country is, is really self-destroying. I mentioned that. Even the Europeans were really infuriated. The Commission was trying to invent a bypass of the, of the thing, and it didn't work, by the way. So, uh, and, and my last point would be, uh, of course, it is... Joko, can I remind you that 50 years ago, an American Treasury Secretary said, it's our currency, but it's your problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Connolly. Connolly. <laughs> it's our currency, it's your problem. That's true. That's true. Still true. Uh, 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 last point. Uh, we had a very good discussion on the balance for the central banks between uh, considering that the price of uh, some commodities and uh, the, the, I would say, inflation burst uh, is both depressive or recessive and inflationary. And so you have to balance the fact that you have to fight against the, the inflationary aspect, but be very careful that it is also recessive. And there are differences between the US and Europe. It's more recessive in Europe, so that justify a monetary policy significantly different, obviously, and will continue to be significantly different. But in any case, there is a point fix, an Archimedes, Archimedean point, if I may, which is that you must go down in a reasonable time to price stability. Otherwise, you are in a situation of the Fed in the 70s and beginning of the 80s. Then Paul Volcker comes. Inflation is at 14% and sustainable in the long run, if I may. He has to do what is necessary. And what is necessary is much more dramatic than being a little bit ahead of the curve and try to regain control in time. Because when you have an inflation at 14%, uh, your short-term interest rates are at 19 and 20 at certain moments to regain control, and you trigger a dramatic recession and a dramatic financial crisis. Uh, nothing to, to be compared to what we expect will happen, taking into account that the central banks are not... Uh, nonchalant, and they are not saying, OK, no problem, we don't, uh, we don't move because the recessionary impact of what's happening is sufficient to correct the trajectory. But if, if, when they do that, when they do nothing, all the second round effects are uh, uh, materializing, and, and the situation becomes really very dramatic. So it's a, I, I understand that there is a balance to be found. And it's normal that academia is reflecting permanently and on the impact, of course, on the social fabric and the political social fabric of what, what is being done. But, but, but it's very serious stuff. And, uh, and I am reassured that both central banks and all central banks, uh, to, to be frank, of the advanced economy, had said we, have, we are trying to anchor expectations 2% in three years' time is something which is reasonable and it is what we will try to deliver. This is reassuring, because, and also because it's the same goal, not the same monetary policy, not the same situation, but the same goal. <laughs>
I think that uh, the audience could applaud, perhaps, uh, the, uh, the speakers. <laughs> Thank you, indeed.